Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives, where you can listen to every episode we've ever done, going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is December 6, 2019, and my guest is author, economist, and Nobel laureate Robert Schiller of Yale University where he is the Sterling Professor of Economics. He appeared on Econ Talk in September of 2008 to talk about housing and bubbles. His latest book and the subject of today's conversation is Narrative Economics. Bob, welcome back to Econ Talk. My pleasure. What do you mean by narrative economics? For me, narrative economics is the study of popular narratives that relate to economic behavior. People change their thinking about economic issues through time, and this causes events, economic events, I believe. And the form that their change of thinking takes is stories. They don't write down equations or draw diagrams. They, they, they tell stories, narratives, stories with a bit of morals to them or, more, or lessons in them. Uh, and then if those stories go viral, we see economic changes. So the idea is to study them, to catalog narratives, uh, put, group them, look at their history. We have they occurred before. How have they changed? That's the idea. Along the way, you talk about um, a little bit about the neuroscience of of this idea and that certainly we as human beings like stories, we're attracted to stories, we're, we're more likely to remember stories. That's right. Uh, and this has always been true. Uh, a book I can recommend is uh, uh, the Roman Senator Cicero's book written 2000 years ago on rhetoric. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's on oratory. Uh, and, uh, he tells you uh, how to make your speeches into a story. Uh, and I, I think that uh, good speakers have learned how to stimulate audiences so that they'll talk about it and uh, remember it. Yeah. That's going viral. You could go viral in ancient Rome. <laughs> they did. Well, Cicero did. We still remember him. This is true. I'm, I'm reminded of Deirdre McCluskey's um series of books uh, on the transformation of the world standard of living, where, where she argues that the belief, the belief that it was okay to be bourgeois, the belief that it was honorable to um, lead a what we would call a, a middle class or successful life, helped create the conditions that led to more and more people uh, having that standard of living. And I'm a little bit skeptical of that argument, but that's the kind of argument that you're making throughout this book. Yes, that's one example of a narrative. That's a peculiarly American narrative. This country was founded on people who were refugees from economic and other stresses and who heard about this country, that there's no royalty over there. <laughs> they don't believe in aristocracy or any of that nonsense. Uh, it was a powerful narrative, uh, and it's still with us, uh, and it still helps define America. Well, interestingly, her her narrative begins in Europe, um, and you know, with with Smith and others who who created this idea of of growth and prosperity as as what you might call, and you refer to this idea a number of times in the book, as a self fulfilling prophecy or a self fulfilling narrative. And certainly, uh, there's a psychological set of psychological theories that. You know, if you believe strongly enough in something, you raise the chances of it happening for yourself, confidence in yourself. I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical about all these arguments that they tend to abstract from or dismiss uh, underlying what, what would be traditional economic arguments for economic change and, and economic events. Um, I, I guess the question that, that came to my mind in reading your book is, how do we know that these stories that we tell ourselves and that become shared stories, which is crucial for this uh, 
uh, you know, becomes a national story in the case of America, as you're talking about. How, how do we know they're not just what we tell ourselves, that, that our beliefs are just sort of window dressing to what we actually do and care about as opposed to causal? First of all, I'm not dismissing traditional economics. I'm adding a, an element to them. Uh, secondly, yeah, if you doubt causality, you, you, uh, what modern economics does is uh, look for natural experiments or do controlled experiments. In that regard, I can tell you that there's many controlled experiments that show that narratives affect human behavior. Uh, and these uh, controlled experiments are not macroeconomic experiments. <laughs> Those are very difficult to do. Uh, ethically uh, problematical. But they are experiments that show that people respond to stories. In fact, outside of economics, that's uh, in marketing or in journalism uh, and in communications, uh, other departments, it's just uh, it's, it's perfectly natural. At one of my book talks, a woman came in who was a journalism person and her questions, she said, why isn't all of this obviously true? Uh, so uh, it's, I don't think it's completely obvious. But uh, uh, you well, ask, what is really changing through time? Yeah, sometimes, you know, when they invented locomotives, that was a technological thing that was, had economic significance, uh, and it produced a rail, railroad industry. Uh, but on top of that, there was also the – those trains were the coolest thing <laughs> People wrote poems about it when they first came out. Amazing. That thing goes 75 miles an hour, and it seems to be perfectly safe. Just amazing. This is the future here. So the narrative was also part of the story and why we had bubbles in railroad stocks when they first appeared. Well, I'm, I'm, I, that could be true, that last part. I'm not, I'm not sure that that's true. I, I, I think the I – don't, I don't doubt, I think – Everyone would agree that that they that the products we buy can be affected by how we perceive their relationship to our identity, for example, what they say about us, and that's certainly part of our personal narrative, right? I mean, that's I, I agree with that. But I think the broader claim you're making, and although you say you're not uh, dismissing standard economic things, you write you write in the book a key proposition in this book is that economic fluctuations are substantially driven by contagion of oversimplified and easily transmitted variants of economic narratives. That's a strong claim, right? That that's, goes against what most macroeconomists believe. I'm, I'm interested in the claim. I think it could be true, but most macroeconomists would say, are you out of your mind? It's fiscal well, policy. Yeah. It's monetary policy. I mean, some people might say it's mostly monetary. Others might say it's mostly fiscal, but that's the debate. Yeah. The idea that it's somehow driven by Say Keynesian animal spirits, which we like to quote, I wrote, <laughs> but we don't I wrote really a book believe with that title. By yeah, the way. I know <laughs> with Akerlof. <laughs> but but uh, what's your what's your response to those macroeconomists who say it's come on, it's not what people or what's not what's in the newspaper about stories that people come to accept. It's all about the economic forcing variables of taxes and money supply growth or contraction. It's it's about spending. Yeah. Well, it's difficult to embrace all of these theories, but my first thought to answer that would be to say, we are undergoing a data revolution now, and it's going to change some of our thinking. We now have digitized text, newspapers, books, magazines, diaries, sermons, all kinds of legal briefs, all kinds of things you can search, and we're developing tools in, from computer science that enables us to search these more. So that means now, going forward, in coming decades, this data will be dominant in new economics because we can finally find out what people are thinking. Uh, when Milton Friedman said, don't ask people why they do things, uh, that was in another day, that was in another era of information. It looked back then that if you talked about those stories, it looked kind of frivolous because you can't prove anything or you can't develop a, uh, a concrete database of knowledge about those stories. Well, you technically could. You could go to the library and ask for the microfilm room and you could spend years 
trying to find out what newspapers were saying by reading them without any ability to search them. But that didn't happen. But I'm thinking going forward, we're going to see more and more. It's going to take decades for economics to fully embrace. It. This is the new thing. I think it will be the new thing. Uh, and it will change the way we think about it. There's another new thing, which I don't stress as much in the book, and that's neuroeconomics and the human brain. Uh, as we learn more how it works, we don't have to build such abstract models of uh, how people actually make economic decisions. We'll have more direct information. That's starting to happen, too. Well, I want to stick, let's stick with the first part, the increasing data we're going to have on what people said about various events as captured in newspapers, sermons, et cetera. Aren't we really just learning about what people say they think matters? I mean, to defend Milton Friedman for a minute, I, th I think <laughs> he would argue that, uh, and I know George Stigler liked to point this out as well, that when people do things, they might say why they do things, but that often isn't what actually motivated them. And I'd argue more importantly, we don't even, it's not so much deception of others when I answer that question. I deceive myself all the time. So survey data, say, which you which you refer to a little bit in the book, uh, it's not the main point, but survey data, for example, that asks, why did you do X, Y, or Z? Why did you buy a house? Was it, were you motivated by a speculative motive or not? How much? Now, those are interesting. They teach us something about what people say motivates them. Does it really teach us what actually motivates them? Well, I wasn't actually proposing that we ask them, why did you do this? That That is... Although, actually, I think that's a useful first step. Admittedly, yeah, people won't be able to tell you, why didn't you buy a new car this year when you, you know, car sales have fallen? You know, they can't quite say. You know, I, the old one, they'll, they'll say something like, the old one is still working. I can keep it going. I didn't get around to it. They don't remember exactly. They can't articulate. You're, you're, Milton Friedman was right on this. Uh, they can probably say definitively that something wasn't on their mind. <laughs> I never heard of that. Uh, but in terms of what actually uh, did it, that is hard to um, explain sometimes. Uh, or why right now, at this time in history, they say that U.S. Uh, consumption demand is high. Yeah, it, it gets into psychology or maybe even into psychoanalysis. Now, psychoanalysts don't believe that what you, <laughs> the first explanation you give of your behavior is right. That's anathema to psychoanalysis, sure. uh, that you have deep uh, subconscious thoughts. That, But I think, uh, and so I'm just thinking, this isn't in my book at all. Freud wrote a book called Interpretation of Dreams, <laughs> okay? Right. So why did he look at dreams instead of uh, looking at what people say? It's because he believed, along with Milton Friedman, that you can't trust what the uh, you know ostensible reasons they give. You have to listen to their stories. Dreams are stories. Here's another piece of information, why uh, evidence, why narratives matter, because they come to us in our in our dreams at our most undefended moments, uh, and they take the form generally of human interest stories about people. That's what you dream. You don't dream equations or, or geometrical shapes. So th there's something about the human brain that is very attuned to stories and driving lessons from them. But the lessons might be hard to articulate. And uh, we have to work at it. Uh, so I'm not averse to letting some psychoanalysts into this game, too. But let's think about macroeconomics and, and in particular the beliefs people have, say, about the state of the economy or um, – I, I, I was thinking of Ed Lehmer's um, macroeconomic um, textbook. He, he says, I think, at the beginning, very beginning of that book that human beings are um, pattern-seeking, storytelling animals. And we have all these stories we tell about the economy, uh, both as everyday people but also as professional economists – and there's not that much evidence that they're true. Uh, you know, just to take the example that he points to, if you step back and you look at, say, the evolution of GDP over the last 75 years, it goes up and down and up and down. But mostly it's a pretty steady up uh, between 2 to 3 percent a year. Every once, per, you know, every once in a while, it, there's a recession and it gets back typically on track. The, the 2008 
Great Recession may be an exception to that. But in general, the economy just bumps along. It bumps along at the, pretty much the same rate, regardless of whether there's high tax rates, low tax rates, loose money, all kinds of different. It, it seems to be very invariant to the things that economists are obsessed with. And, you know, our narratives, um, we have our own narratives. It's not clear they're correct. So I'm not sure. I, I don't know. I, I thought of your book more as I know this isn't your main focus, but I thought of it as illuminating the way we as professional economists have these somewhat absurd views of, of what makes the world tick on the left and the right. We, you know, we, we have different narratives depending on where our, our ideology is, but it's not obvious that how, how we know whether they're right or not. I don't think we're very good at that. Well, I think we are affected as economists by narratives as well. So there is the recession narrative that has been – popular ever since uh, the 1937-38 recession. The, the, you don't say the D word, depression, because that's considered like shouting fire in a crowded theater. But it's okay to talk about recessions. But you know, you're absolutely right. If you plot gross domestic product back to the beginning in the official numbers, that's 1929, uh, you see that most of the time it's just yeah, it's growing along. If you do it on a log scale, it's growing along like a straight line yeah. with little wobbles around it. Yeah. Uh, that That is forgotten. Newspaper writers have to keep generating news, okay? So they don't like to point out that this is kind of not that big a deal. But if you look at the whole plot, you do see uh, GDP had made some major swings right at the beginning with the Great Depression. Sure. And then the hugest expansion of all was the Great Depression returning into the World War II. This reminds me why it isn't a particularly good idea to take GDP as a sign of, prosper of, of human welfare, because World War II, we wouldn't want to go through again. Absolutely. But it was, a, it was a very high time for GDP. So that was a story. The, the, why did we have World War II? What, what a stupid thing to do, right? It yeah. didn't do anything good. It was because of Mr. Hitler's stories. Uh, you know, he, he was a uh, totally dishonest and angry man. His entertainment value, it's, it's fun to look at some of his speeches. I think that's which, well, people don't recommend that you do that because they're afraid you might like it. <laughs> okay. But I think you can see how it was amusing. The guy was a showman and he, he kept d performing his art in rallies. Uh, so World War II was a so, – so the biggest expansion of all, that from the Great Depression to World War II, was, was dominated by stories, the stories of the Great Depression and then the stories of uh, live, live or die uh, in, in this horrible war. World War II and the Great Depression is an interesting example. Uh, I often point out on the program that you know, the cause of the Great Depression and the cause of its end, there are a bunch of narratives about it. Uh, they're all interesting. They all have maybe something to say about them. Uh, you know, was it was it caused? Was where were was the Great Depression caused by a run up in the stock, the crash of the stock market? Was it caused by the bank runs? Was it caused by the forfeiture of of mortgages and and farms and and its impact that spread outward? Was it caused by Smoot Hawley's tariffs? Was it caused by a contraction of the money supply? Was it caused by the failure of the Fed to respond to that? So on and so on and so on. And then you have similar, why did it end? Well, for a long time, people thought, well, it ended because of the New Deal. Then economists looked a little closer. That's, that narrative didn't hold up so well. So then it was, oh, it ended because of the war. And I view that narrative as not so convincing. As you point out, it wasn't a particularly prosperous time. Forget the death. That, that, that's obviously a bad yeah. <laughs> side of it. But just, you know, it's a, there's a huge measurement problem after the war. Excuse me. During the war, as the war came to an end, economists like Paul Samuelson and others said we're going to have a major uh, contraction, a depression again, right, right. because U.S. spending, government spending is going to collapse, which it did. But the depression didn't happen. So we told another yeah. narrative. There was pent up demand for cons for vacations that you talk about. There was pent up demand for, you know, uh, appliances. All this is just story. Again, it's just, to me, it's just storytelling. I don't think we have a good idea of what actually caused or ended the Great Depression. Uh, okay, so uh, my take on that, it, it, it's true there will be many stories. 
they're all part of it. We have to do an accounting. So this is sounds like an academic thing, but we want to do it because we're scholars, right? Uh, so it seems to me that those narratives each had a contribution. Some going the other way, yeah. uh, and uh, it, you have to you have to under. You we're trying to understand the phenomenon, right? Of the Great Depression is the important phenomenon to try to understand, and the war, which might have been generated by in response to it. Yeah. In fact, you know, when Hitler took over in Germany, it was a time of high, very high unemployment and dissatisfaction Correct. and anger in Germany about the employment situation. So my thought is that uh, we have to understand that we're living in a jungle of narratives. There's just so many of them, some of them more prominent than others, uh, and some of them having different uh, economic consequences. But we have to start classifying them and chronicling them uh, and understanding that uh, evolutionary dynamics, epidemics, going viral matters. Uh, and uh, it, it will always be a little difficult to do the summation and to explain how much various stories affected uh, the economy. But that's the only way to really uh, approach an understanding of economic fluctuations. You have to look at all the things. This is macroeconomics. It's the sum of everything. So let me take a modern narrative that's increasingly common uh, that the current state of the U.S. economy. I just interviewed um, Benjamin Applebaum about his book, The Economist Hour. And in that book, that episode hasn't come out yet, but it, it will by the time this one airs that we're having. In that book, he argues, as a number of people do recently, um, uh, that somehow free market economists became t to dominate public policy – and that explains the slow growth rates in the United States in the last 50 years, the slowing growth rate. It explains the rise in inequality. It explains the death of unions. It explains the mediocrity of, of standard of living for the, the large group of Americans. And I listen to this narrative, and about four-fifths of it rings false to me, factually. But, okay, it, how would we know whether that narrative, which is, you know, common on, on many – in many media sources – whether that narrative is, first of all, whether it's true. And secondly, does it does it matter? Is it going to make it more or less likely that, uh, say, a different kind of policy is tried in the United States? Or is, just, is it just entertainment? It's just something we tell ourselves and like to, to talk about because it's, it's drama. Well, I'm arguing that it's not just drama. <laughs> it's revealing human patterns of thought. And economists have to pay attention to it. Is this realistic? When we say people are maximizing expected utility, taking account the time series properties of interest rates, et cetera, uh, you know, it starts sometimes to sound like storytelling also. You know, people are not forecasting interest rates with any care or diligence. They never read the paper. Uh, they never read the uh, interest rate. They don't know, even know what it is now. So uh, it, to say that those stories are dominant over stories that people actually talk about seems to me a mistake and that we can correct it. But it will, it will involve the, – the macro economy is sufficiently complex that we won't have certainty as to this accounting of stories. We'll have, we'll have uh, I think, better insights into what drives things. But uh, it's, a, it's a tough problem to understand uh, economic fluctuations because it's, it's just millions or billions of people involved. It's more worldwide now. And to me, it's really just so striking how narratives spread. Uh, so I, I'm thinking of uh, the Donald Trump narrative. He is the most famous man in the world, and it happens suddenly, and it has economic consequences uh, uh, and where did he come from so he, well, he was around for 50 years before that and we weren't paying any attention to him or how about Greta Thunberg uh, she's 16 years old and suddenly she's exploded to uh, one of the most famous maybe she is the most famous woman in the world now I'm not That's sure the most famous 16 year old woman <laughs> I, I'm <laughs> sure of that and uh 
And she has an economic message, which is to cut back on uh, spending. Uh, so, uh, and return to an earlier time. To say that that is not uh, relevant and that the idea that people are optimizing their consumption in respect of interest rates, I, I've, I've bet more on Thunberg <laughs> than the interest rate. Now, I, I don't mean to diminish it. The interest rates matter, especially for home purchasers. They look at the monthly payment, and then that affects how much they think they can own. So it definitely matters. I'm not, but that's old. I, I'm just trying to bring up what we haven't understood so far. So the, let's try to hone in on this a little more um, precisely. It's um, it's December sixth today. It's a Friday. It's the first Friday of December. So the employment numbers came out a couple hours ago, and to the surprise of some economists, forecasters who make a living or try to make a living doing this. Uh, it was it was employment was unusually unexpectedly robust. It increased by two hundred and sixty six thousand. The unemployment rate fell to three point five percent. And I haven't seen it, but I'm sure President Trump's gonna trump it, if I may say so, <laughs> yeah. these these numbers. And he's gonna tell a story that that this is due to him. And right. uh, I have to say that I, I have no idea if that's true. Uh, you could make a claim. I've heard people make this claim, smart people, actually, I, I should add, that, yes, he deserves credit because he's deregulated some parts of the economy that didn't shouldn't have been regulated as much, and that stimulated investment. Some people would credit his tax cuts, but other people would point out, well, gee, the biggest thing he's done is he's put tariffs on that usually we would suggest or slow down economic activity, and yet economy's bubbling along. So the real – I think the question for you – I want to try to pin you down a little bit here. The question is, if you want to understand why the economy is growing so well many, many months into the, what is a very long expansion now, is that, you think, due to beliefs that people hold or is it due to actual policy and changes in economic incentives? Well, the answer you might expect from me is it's both. Well, I knew you'd say that, but go ahead. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> well, it's just not a simple world that we live in. But I think that we don't want to uh, assume that the Trump's uh, effects are mainly through taxes you know, uh, and tariffs and the like. Uh, that's an economist uh, uh, fixation to, to dominate that. I think that also is just a general sense uh, of uh, of life that he gives. Uh, he's a success story that obviously people will want to emulate. He is the most famous man. And uh, one thing that he stands for is ostentatious living. He he, he boasts about, uh, about his glamour hotels and clubs and the like. Uh, uh, he writes books that are uh, motivational, uh, inspirational books. Uh, he tells you, don't be afraid of boasting uh, because, you know, realistically, people won't hear about your successes if you don't boast about them. So go ahead and do it. That'll annoy them. And the, I'm sort of not exactly quoting him, but it's something like this. It might annoy them to hear your boasting, but it will be a good thing. Do it. <laughs> That's what he says. And, uh, Maybe he's right. You know, uh, millions of us are probably reconsidering. Have I been too modest? Uh, and why have I uh, tried to live a modest life? Uh, the success story is to go for the glamour. And uh, uh, I think that sort of thing might be more important than the tax cuts in affecting the stock market. So I'll come back to that in a minute, but I'll just ask the simpler question. How would you know? Well, some th they, people ask us for our opinions, okay, as economists. And I think opinions are uh, part of the uh, human, uh, well-considered opinions about the economy or politics are difficult to pin down. Nobody can prove what's going to happen. Uh, but wiser people are people who have studied a number of different elements of drivers in history and who uh, who are not fixated on one model that is thought to be glamorous. Uh, and the model itself is a narrative, one among many. 
so uh, I, yeah, it, it's you know economics is not an exact science. That's what Alfred Marshall said over a hundred years ago. The smart and, man. <laughs> yeah, he was. His textbook, Principles of Economics, it's pretty good. I was thinking of assigning it now. That was 1890 when he wrote that. It's a good book. Uh, a lot of insight in there, for sure. It's on our website. You can, I think, I'm pretty sure it is. We we'll yeah. put a link up to it. You can read it today for without charge on the web. But I guess the question I'm asking is that uh, here, here's my skepticism. I, I am, I am comfortable with the idea that that. A president like Trump could encourage people, say, to be less modest and more boastful. You're making a bolder claim. You're saying it's just not just that he affects the culture. And, of course, there are going to be a bunch of people who are going to start living in huts because um, – in shacks and in thatched roofs because they really don't like President Trump. They're going to go the other way. But I understand that his cultural attitudes could affect our culture. You're suggesting it, it affects our – economic behavior. It affects our decisions about whether to spend, invest, and that that in turn affects business fluctuations, correct? Right. So how do you decide whether to buy a new car? And on top of that, you have to decide whether to buy a glamour car or a uh, cheap car, right? Yep. What goes through your mind? You're thinking about uh, uh, how your family will react, uh, whether their children will be proud of their parents, <laughs> I don't know what the neighbors will think. Yeah, you can't deny that. Uh, and so I was arguing particularly about the Great Depression. In the Great Depression, from 1929 to uh, 1932, Ford car sales dropped over. I think it's about 86 percent. I think close to 90 percent drop. Now you might say that's just the multiplier effect. It's a it's a durable, so you can avoid it. But I look what people were saying, and it, it seems like there was a change in attitude brought on by the Great Depression. People love to talk about that change in attitude since. They'd say, you can, walking down the street, you can get a different vibes. They didn't say vibes, something yeah. like that. Uh, that women's skirt lengths went down. This is a famous story. I know it sounds uh, crazy, but uh, the Roaring Twenties were short skirts and women – drinking and frolicking <laughs> and that, in the 30s they they started going back to church yeah that was their story about their time we've we're a more sober time and some people said you know people are just nicer now you don't part of the reason you don't buy a new car in the great depression is the family next door are the the, the breadwinner is unemployed the children have come home come over to your house asking for food, <laughs> you're not going to buy a glamorous new car at that time. It just doesn't feel right. So I know I can't prove it, but economists do so many things that can't be proven already. I think this goes into the mix. <laughs> I like that. And I, I, I also very much like the idea that, that we're very sensitive to how we're perceived and our reputation uh, what our neighbors think of us. And, and I do think that's been neglected. It's, it's all in the theory of moral sentiments by Adam Smith, by the way, as my listeners know all too well. Uh, yeah, it's a great book. So, yes, it is. And I, so I have no, um, I certainly agree with that. And I certainly think we've neglected uh, those phenomena, our social connections and our, I would say also just the stories we tell ourselves about our identity. I think the bigger challenge for the, the stronger claims in the book is that it's not obvious how we would distinguish you know, these explanations for more traditional ones and what, what's causal versus reacting. And I, you're aware of that, obviously. I'm not, I'm not suggesting it's not, it's not in the book. Obviously, you understand that. But you're pushing this as a way to get us to, to explore this. And a lot of what's in the book, I should let readers know, is, is treating narratives as, uh, as epidemics of, um, uh, of beliefs, shared beliefs that we can track via in modern times, via Google, we can see how frequently words show up, at least in books, certainly in on the web, and that that tells us something important about at least how we see ourselves. That's where I, I'm certainly on, in agreement with you. Well, okay, so um, I know where to go from here. Uh, well, that's okay. <laughs> I, I, I think I, I think that professions swing over a decade. There, there was a. Uh, a mathematical economics uh, uh, of more than one decade 
where general equilibrium theory was the hot stuff. And then, you know, it, it's itself an epidemic within the academic community. Uh, and then it, it has started to fade. Uh, and I, I think uh, another thing that is happening that's coming back, re reflected by the Nobel Prize uh, this year, uh, to uh, DeFlo, uh, Banerjee, and Creamer, is experimental economics. Uh, that's that they could have done that a uh, hundred years ago, but I, I can't think of a ex single example from more, more than thirty years ago. Isn't that right? Well, Vernon Smith was doing, was doing Vernon Smith was doing some, I think, in the fifties. So, but not certainly not not in the first half of the twentieth century. That again, as I know of. Yeah. Uh, but the, what Vernon Smith was trying to do is a little bit different than what. Uh, the Nobel laureates are doing in terms of development economics, trying to understand what might be effective. Uh, Smith and others were trying to figure out sort of more of the, the fundamentals of human behavior, which is, you know, it's unclear whether we can generalize. I think there's an underlying narrative uh, that we're not talking about, which is that economists think they're scientists. Uh, and that precision that you point out is often missing is makes most economists very uncomfortable. And so, uh, they like they have a narrative about themselves that that they're doing something akin to quote real science. So I, I tell my students to take risks, uh, not necessarily in the direction of behavioral economics, but there's a lot of prejudices prejudices in academia. Yeah, and uh, you don't want to be the mild mannered guy who doesn't disagree with anything. <laughs> That's not a route to your success. Yeah, I mean, th I mean, this book is. Once you have a Nobel Prize, you can certainly take a few more risks without bearing as many costs. So <laughs> this is a risky book, certainly, in, in that sense. Let's talk about one of the narratives in the book that uh, you spend some time on that I think about a lot, which is automation and its effect on jobs. You point out that this is a, uh, a very old narrative of, of fear that automation, robots, technology will eliminate uh, human employment and and lead to, therefore, social crisis and disruption. Uh, explain, tell us a little bit about the evolution of that narrative over time and, and where do you think it stands now? And, and again, why it's important? Well, the narrative goes back over 2,000 years to Aristotle. It's only in one paragraph in all of his works, but he does say that, uh, 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 he doesn't use it. Well, actually, I do use the word uh, automation. That goes back to, um, I'm sorry, I'm being a little dis uh, discursive here. It was Homer in his Iliad uses the word automato, automatio, I guess, in Greek to describe some devices called the tripods of Hephaestus. A little, they were a little bit like robots. <laughs> They're in that book. That's amazing. Yeah. But then Aristotle also talked about a mechanical uh, loom. Uh, uh, of the future, uh, and, but I don't think it was a, it was a dominant worry. It, it was a weak narrative in the ancient world. Uh, but uh, starting with uh, the, the turning point came uh, uh, in um, early UK, where again it was loom uh, people, who uh, uh, luddites they were called who uh, staged a protest against mechanization. And then, it, then it went under the title of uh, uh, labor, uh, labor reducing machines or devices. Uh, and then it got changed to technological unemployment. And then it got changed to automation. And then it got, these are different words describing the same thing. Now the term that is most uh, viral is um, t uh, is uh, artificial intelligence uh, or machine learning. But they're all referring back to the same fear that people have about being replaced. Or you might say a fear of not being able to find some other work uh, that uh, is even puts them in an even better place. So all along, people would point out that when you lose your job to a machine, who's to say you won't find something even better in a more rich country so that that's been a competing narrative all along but it's not as powerful or as interesting not as contagious so we tend to get thrown off by the more contagious version and the, the frankenstein narrative is a variation on that right it's that that human creations 
human interference with nature will lead to destructive, unintended consequences that we won't be able to control, that will spiral out of control. And so this narrative, the one you're talking about with automation, as you say, it's a very old narrative. It's it's at least uh, – you could argue it's thousands of years old, but certainly at the front of many, many people's minds, it's it's hundreds of years old. And I believe it's a false narrative, okay? I might be wrong, but I think it's a generally, until now at least, it's been a false narrative. It has not been the case that automation has reduced the number of opportunities available to human beings. Certainly, it's reduced the opportunities to some types of skill uh, at any point in time, but it's been a false narrative. So here's here's my, my question. Uh, I don't think it's an error that has much significance except as an entertainment, the equivalent of, say, a horror movie. People go to horror movies. They like to be scared. They like to be imagine the worst. I'm not quite sure why that's true. I'm sure there's some good books written on that, but I don't know them. But I don't think it's affected, had much of an impact on economic policy. I don't see, or outcomes, right? The human impulse to create is unabated, continues to go forward. Technology continues to advance. And even though people are scared about driverless cars, which I think are unlikely in the way that people at least imagine them f even five years ago, but people are worried about them um, because of what it'll do to cab drivers and others, not stopping it going forward. It just keeps going. So does that narrative matter other than as an entertainment, as a way to, to for us to scare ourselves, the equivalent to reading, say, Frankenstein by Mary Shelley? Well, Frank, I want to talk about Frankenstein, which seems more uh, – the idea that I might uh, be replaced by a machine is not peren not always prominent. And I don't think it's particularly prominent now, despite all the talk about artificial intelligence. But it does at times uh, seem to affect people's judgments about whether to spend or invest. Notably, the Great Depression, that was a period when there was a lot of fear of robots replacing jobs. And as I show in my book, lots of people thought that was a real thing. It obviously was not. Uh, but if you, if, you, if you look at newspapers of the day, that was a dominant story. And then, then let's get back to thinking about decisions. Uh, if you interpret the high unemployment of the Great Depression as possibly due to uh, technological unemployment, isn't that going to – why wouldn't that affect your decisions? Whether to, Let's take a big vacation right now and uh, uh, – or buy, a, uh, uh, buy two cars instead of one. Uh, you, you, you would want to save more because you, you think you have a bigger cushion. That's rational response to such a narrative. So we know that the narrative was prominent, and we know what a rational response would be to the narrative. So why are we doubting that it was important at that time? And I think now the artificial intelligence narrative may become more ominous if we hit another recession. Then there will be people saying it's due to machines, and then there won't be any way to prove they're wrong. Well, I guess the, I guess – one way to look at it, as you're suggesting, is that, well, it might not affect public policy because that's more complicated, but it will affect people's attitudes towards their future, and that will in turn affect their their decisions to invest or, or save. And um, I suppose that's true. I guess the other thing to think about, uh, I know you know this because you're a teacher. Uh, one of the most shocking things as a teacher is that students will not be able to answer a question that you've talked about sometimes more than once. And you say, <laughs> well, well. Why didn't you get that right? Well, I never heard it before. And you think, well, yes, you did. I told you three times, but it never went yeah. in. It just didn't go in. It's like, yeah. it's like um, some people listening right now, they've heard the name of this of your book. I've mentioned it at least once, maybe twice. It's called Narrative Economics. I want to thank, by the way, uh, Plantronics for providing uh, Robert Schiller's uh, headset today. And some <laughs> listeners have wondered, is EconTalk now taking money from Plantronics? <laughs> which would be kind of nice. We're not, but we are accepting their headsets, uh, which we are then shipping out to to uh, guests when we're not doing a face-to-face uh, -face interview. And this is being done uh, via Skype. And I'm just uh, I'm grateful for that. Instead of having to spend the money on the headsets, we can use that money to spend on, on other things. So uh, for those who've been wondering about that, 
Um, that's what what that is about. In the third edition to his Principles of Political Economy in the 1830s, David Ricardo, who was one of the dominant uh, economists of that time, uh, in his preface to the book, to the third edition, said, I am now adding a new chapter on machines. And he said, I've been thinking about since the Luddite, this is like 20 years after the Luddites. Uh, I've been thinking about it. And I used to think that t uh, economic progress for all really was for all, that there was a reason to believe that. But he said, I'm thinking that it might not benefit everyone equally. And I think modern economics has to agree that it might not. Oh, sure. And that there could be uh, income inequality replacing, say, the most uh, simple forms of labor. Uh, and or, or it, it just – it's a concern, even though we don't know whether it will happen. Well, and that's, uh, a, that's a perfect example yeah. because – uh, what I was going to say before is that even though I've mentioned the name of your book a couple times, um, there are thousands of people listening right now who not only have forgotten the name of it, but they've forgotten who the name – who my guest is. They might get your first <laughs> name wrong. They might get your last name wrong. But it is Robert Schiller and his book is Narrative Economics. But we understand – and in marketing, they know this very well – that people forget stuff. They don't see stuff. And the Ricardo example is a fantastic example, Bob, because – He's one of the least read people in, in human history who's important intellectually. <laughs> He's not a great yeah, writer. Right. Uh, we have all of his books available. Uh, I think we have his collected works available online in some fashion in, at, at a website for Liberty Fund, either in the online Library of Liberty or yeah. Library of Economics of Liberty. But it's um, – he's not a great writer. He hasn't read much. I've never heard of that chapter. I'm looking forward to trying to dig into it now. But my point, which is – a little bit roundabout, sorry it took so long, is that even if stuff showed up in the 30s in newspapers about technological unemployment and and fear of replace, being replaced by automation, how many people really noticed? I mean, how do you – that's another problem with your theory, unfortunately, which is, yeah. that, is that, you know, what's published and what goes in, what is absorbed by people in their right. decisions, a whole now other this, question. I, I actually raised that question in my book. I talk about uh, a news, New York Times writer – Pulitzer Prize winning later, uh, Arthur Kroc, who said in 1932, this is the worst time of the de Depression, I'd like to go off on a tour of the United States and just talk about the Depression and let people talk back to me. And what, you know, what do they say? I want to hear America. And so he came back and he wrote for the Times a story about what he heard. And one thing that he said, hardly anyone told me about a book they were reading. <laughs> <laughs> or, or anything solid. It was all just offhand remarks. Uh, so, for example, a taxi driver volunteered to him. He said, you should go out in the, uh, in the alley behind those restaurants over there late at night, and you'll find unemployed people eating garbage that <laughs> the hotels throw, that the restaurants throw away. End of story. Uh, that's the way it goes. It, it, it's not uh, – people in 1830s generally didn't read David Ricardo either. Correct. It's all filtered through by little stories like that one yeah. that, uh, that Croc – maybe the uh, academic scribblers, to quote Keynes, have influence, but it's not direct influence. It goes f first from the, the book to a scholar – and then it goes to some imagery and a, and a story that illustrates it. And then it, it has its influence. Yeah, I'm thinking about the fact that uh, I think a lot of Americans who pay attention to this think that uh, it's a small group still, but that FDR listened to the general theory of Keynes and then decided to increase government spending. And the fact is, he didn't particularly, he met Keynes once, I think. He didn't particularly, at least he said he didn't, wasn't much taken by him. Um, he didn't spend that much more. It wasn't like his enormous response. Uh, but that's a narrative that we tell that that's that Keynes helped the U.S. get out of recession uh, because his book taught politicians about what to do. You, know, you talk about the Laffer curve in your book. And I thought you, know, you didn't mention the Keynesian multiplier, but both of those, the Laffer curve and the Keynesian multiplier are stories that economists tell and that politicians love because they both suggest that a free lunch is possible. You know, the supply-siders believe 
limited evidence for this, but they believe that right. if we cut taxes, we'll, we'll stimulate the economy and get, in fact, we won't even lose money. We'll have more revenue. And then on the other side, we have Keynesians who believe, and again, I think the evidence for this is limited, but they believe as a narrative that if we spend more, it'll we'll get it back in the form of higher taxes because the economy will grow and it won't be deficit, won't be a big, won't grow the deficit. It'll take care of itself and so on and so forth. And both those narratives are extremely dubious in my view. Um, it's certainly in any magnitude that's precise, and yet economists treat them like they're facts. Yeah, those are uh, – by the way, in both cases, they aren't entirely original, <laughs> okay? Keynes multiplier Correct. has antecedents, and so does Laffer curve. Uh, they had uh, 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 people going back to – in fact, Laffer says this. He refers to an Arab scholar like close to a 1,000 years ago who pointed out that taxes will reduce uh, act, economic activity. Yeah, it's not – it's not uh, that – it, that's not but, that but profound, yeah. But they were a story well told. So why is Keynes so famous? Well, first of all, he's, he was a good writer. Yep. But beyond that, charismatic uh, he, guy. He had a sense of marketing. So he entitled his famous 1936 book "The General Theory of Employment, Interest, and Money." First of all, that to say the general theory, <laughs> that that sounds pretentious, doesn't it? Yeah. On top of that. The general theory generally refers to Einstein, who was at that point uh, at his peak popularity. Everybody adored Einstein. So he, he, he created it. And then he married a ballerina, a beautiful ballerina who was a star. And he hobnobbed with the, the Bloomsbury group. So he, he kind of had an idea how to promote himself. Uh, most economists don't do that. I mean, why don't they do it? They have to read Donald Trump and learn some better lessons about self-promotion. You know, marketing matters. And, I, and I've often, even though I'm an enormous fan of Adam Smith, he, he's another example where a lot of his ideas were not original. Uh, they were in other people who'd re, who wrote before him who've been forgotten uh, or literally, uh, you know, ignored. But he was a great writer and um, he's still readable today. He wasn't just a great writer of his time. His his peers, many of them wrote in ways that were not accessible to us today. The style is very uh, alien to us. And um, he was also a great storyteller, which is consistent with your your theme, the, the pin factory, which is his yeah. narrative about specialization, the division of labor. It turns out, I, I think it's true that it's not particularly accurate. He didn't spend a lot of time collecting data on pins. But it's an enduring story because it captures something that's important, and, and it appeals to our brains. And it has visual images. I can picture people yeah. making a pin in 1776, cutting the wire. Yeah. <laughs> I want to let's let's turn to a a different aspect of this, which you don't spend much time on in the book, which I actually find, I confess, given my skepticism, you'll understand. But I I confess I find this maybe a little more appealing than the application to economic fluctuations, which is personal fluctuations, personal choices we make, you know, sort of the microeconomics of micro, you know, super micro, how I see myself, how I decide what to do with my life, uh, how to choose a career path, and so on. And I, you know, I, I wrote a story a while back called The Story of My Life. And I think a lot of us tend to see ourselves as the star of a, of a great film, uh, that, that, that we are, we are the um, some sense the scriptwriter. We concede that there's some other people involved in the script, but they all take an ancillary role to our stardom. And uh, I think that's a very powerful human experience that most of us have. I might be wrong about that. It alarms my wife sometimes when I confess this publicly uh, uh. because it might be just peculiar. But I think it's somewhat true, and that that particular focus of seeing ourselves as the star may not always be so helpful, uh, that it might be better sometimes, I suggest in this essay, that we see ourselves as part of an ensemble, that we're not always the star, but that our natural impulse is to put ourselves first, and that we would profit and the world would be better, perhaps, if we saw ourselves as more of part of a larger cast. Uh, what do you think about that idea of, of thinking of the narrative issue in our personal lives? Well, I, I haven't actually pursued advising people not to do it. <laughs> I think that it's 
built into the the human brain uh, that s- somehow I, I wonder about animals, uh, dogs. Do they have a narrative in their mind? Uh, maybe they do. They don't know that they're going to die. They don't know about basic reproduction. <laughs> they don't know why they're attracted to a female dog <laughs> if they're male. <laughs> Uh, but maybe they do have narratives. So it's it's such an ancient uh, ancient thing. I read about Jane Goodall and her chimps. Now they don't seem to have language, but they do seem to have a social life, and they they uh, uh, they probably think something like that as well. You know, I think of it as too ingrained and built in. Somehow society is built well around people who think they're the center of the universe. Each of them thinks that some way or other. Uh, and it pr- creates a sense of some kind of morale that uh, that drives uh, a successful human race. Well, you know, even though I've pushed back on a lot of the ideas in your book, I do think that narratives are extremely important. Um, they are how we think of ourselves, our identity, our role in our families, our role in our country, our role in the world, our role in history. They are central. Um, so I don't. That part I like, and what I love about your book is it forces you to, to to think about that. And I think, I think it's undeniably true that storytelling isn't just about going to the movies or reading fiction. <laughs> it's it permeates a lot of what of how we see ourselves, and then and of course it affects our behavior. Um, we had Yuval Harari on the program talking about his book Sapiens. I don't I, things I didn't like about that book either, but it it is correct that. Obviously, that book's about the myths we tell ourselves that we share. And again, we can debate about how important those myths are in actual behavior versus what we just believe and think. But it's a big part of life, for sure. Yeah, it's our, uh, central to our feeling of self-worth or uh, achievement or a meaning. What is the meaning of life? Yeah, no, for sure. So this book's been out a few months. Um the part I like about the book is, besides this idea that I do think narratives are important in life, the other part I like about the book is the understanding that economics is not so precise. Uh, other economists probably dislike all of that. Uh, what kind of reaction have you been getting uh, from from your fellow, from your peers and colleagues? Well, this was started out. This book started out three years ago uh, at the twenty seventeen. Uh, annual meetings of the American Economic Association. It was my presidential address. So I presented it first to the assembled. I had a big audience of economists only, and I was a little apprehensive. Rightfully uh, so. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> nobody booed. Oh, okay. <laughs> Not one. <laughs> and uh, I got applause afterwards. Maybe it, it, it wasn't a standing it? ovation, but it was applause. <laughs> So I yeah, but I you know I think that academia is like that. People who say something interesting will always be controversial. So you take Milton Friedman for example. He has he uh, brings in strong feelings, uh, and he might have been right about some things and wrong about others, but he was a uh, he came up with interesting thoughts, and that's the best. Uh, I can hope for <laughs> not to be that great, maybe, but to be uh, provocative. Yeah, and that's a it's an interesting narrative. Of course, we could tell about ourselves, about our career, and what we think we ought to be doing. Uh, let's let's close with uh, policy. You, you do you close with that as well in the book. Um, you know, one reaction to this kind of approach that you're that you're suggesting is that. Well, maybe narratives do matter, but we're not really good at understanding what narratives rise to the top of the viral scope and become viral and which which ones don't. And although it might be nice to have some narratives rather than others, we don't know how to create narratives. Certainly as economists, it's not our specialty. We don't have any comparative advantage in that. Um, what are the implications, if any, for public policy and how we ought to think about um what economists or others should be doing if narratives are as important as you suggest? Well, I, my book is in some sense a research proposal, but not for me. <laughs> it's for this. Uh, it's uh, outlining what I think will be happening over the next thirty years. Uh, it'll be advances in neuroscience, 
coupled with advances in digital text searches and semantic search, we'll have a better idea of the human mind as it relates to human activity. Uh, so uh, I, 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 as for policymakers, I think that a lot of economic policy that is effective uh, already uses narrative economics, but they just haven't quite uh, understood it as well as they could. So, for example, with the Great Recession, uh, government central banks all over the world were stimulative. Uh, but on top of that, they, they tried to uh, pre prevent uh, catastrophe narratives from blossoming. So bailing out companies was a controvert or banks uh, or uh, supporting them in various ways was and remains controversial. Uh, but they felt they had to do it. When Northern Rock collapsed in uh, 2007, the UK government rushed to rescue the depositors because they thought, we don't want another rebirth of bank run stories. I think people know that who have some knowledge of history knows that you want to attack a, bo a bank run at the very beginning because even solid banks can succumb if the public panics too much. So they did that, but I think they did it with, uh, it took some intellectual courage for them to do things like that, these unconventional policies. They were basing it substantially on how to reassure the country, how to keep morale up, instinctive things. But I think that they could be more secure in their knowledge of what they're doing if we, as an, a profession, made more part of our curriculum the uh, effect of narratives and how to understand them. My guest today has been Robert Schiller. His book is Narrative Economics. Bob, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Russ, my pleasure. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday. <laughs>